be talking about Quake Mission Pack number two, The Dissolution of Eternity. Uh, if you haven't had a chance to look at my review of the base Quake game, which I picked up on the PlayStation 5, or the first mission pack, uh, links to those will be in the description box below. I highly recommend you play this game. I cannot say enough good things about Quake. Um, this particular offering is phenomenal, including tons and tons of DLC, which I have slowly been working my way through. Um, this video is going to focus pretty much on the second mission pack, which is the Dissolution of Eternity. Now, when the original Quake launched, way back when, uh, they did two planned DLCs. This is the second of those quote-unquote original DLCs. Um, there will be future content later on, but it was made much more recently in celebration of Quake and in kind of the spirit of Quake. This one was actually made way back in the day. It was made by Rogue Entertainment, and it came out on March 19th, 1997. It was about a month after the first mission pack came out. So this is very different than the first one. Um, where I thought the first mission pack did so well was that it had such a heavy story element to it. Um, I felt the level design and the kind of telling of the game essentially really, really captivated me. It showed you kind of the progression of being back on Earth, then going through the portal, working your way through more challenging areas, you know, very distinct looking level design, ultimately culminating against this final boss battle, which was really tons of fun. This one seems to be more in line with kind of the original, you know, stone corridor, gateway to hell, creepy, surreal sky type of gameplay. And that doesn't mean it's bad. Uh, it's just different. Um, I don't know which of the two I liked better. They both, I think, serve kind of different audiences in a sense. They still obviously focus on that phenomenal first person shooting gameplay. However, I feel like in the second mission pack, um, it's a little bit more focus on gunplay and there's definitely some very interesting level designs and you'll see some of that featured today. I'm just showing a random level here the, just so you guys kind of get a taste of what's going on. And to be clear, I don't save scum. I do a lot of safety saves <laughs> because this game is punishing and nothing is more frustrating than being cheesed by an enemy who teleports next to you. And that, I think, is where I'll start with the review today by saying that they have really thrown everything at you in this final base DLC. You will go into rooms that are absolutely dripping with enemies. And that is actually a lot of fun because the AI has the ability to fight each other at times. And a lot of times you can kind of just go in and stir things up and let them kind of take care of each other. Um, however, uh, there are also a lot of times that there are just so many enemies that you're just shooting rockets wildly, getting so much splash damage, and it's a lot of fun that way as well. What isn't so much fun though is that little teleport noise which you may have just heard, that, that infamous quake teleport noise, which lets you know that enemies have randomly spawned into the world. And that happens so often, particularly right behind you, almost always when you're picking up a weapon or a piece of armor or a key that looks like it's just all by itself. Um, they have really gone, in my opinion, a little bit overboard with that. And I think it takes away some of the fun level design you know, not to say that Quake is a horror game, it's not, but that excitement of like turning the corner and wondering kind of what's around the next corner with the creepy shadows and the creepy music kind of blaring up and seething up um, kind of goes away because you could just basically expect that around every single corner, if there isn't an enemy, one is going to spawn almost instantly and just punch you basically point blank. So keep that in mind. Um, this game does feature two separate episodes, uh, very similar to the original base Quake game. There's episode one, Hell's Fortress, and episode two, The Corridors of Time. Um, both of them play very similarly with similar weapons, enemies, lay level design, layout, that sort of thing. Enemies, they have changed quite a bit on this front. Um, we have quite a few new enemies. Uh, we now have electric eels in the water. There are also, which you just saw a minute ago, the Phantom Swordsman, which 
when it first attacked me, I was like, wait, is there a flying sword actually fighting me? Yes, there is. <laughs> um, they've also done some design with the ogres. You find a lot of ogres in this game. Those are the guys with the chainsaws and the grenade launchers. Um, they not only have a, a lot of different cosmetics to them now, they also have uh, multi-headed ogres, um, which uh, do slightly different mechanics, shoot different weapons, that sort of thing. Um, I don't know if you're going to see any hell spawn today. There's also Wraiths, Guardians, and Statues, which you definitely will not see in this level. Um, but rest assured, they did a good job of keeping the base set of enemies, also while adding a litany of new enemies as well. Um, this game also features a heavy emphasis on bosses. There are a significant amount of boss fights in this game. And that's something that I really appreciate because I feel like when you get into these giant arenas and you're fighting distinct looking larger than life enemies, it feels like a great reward for taking your time, getting your armor levels up, getting all the great weapons in the game and just going and just smoking through a very creepy looking sounding type of enemy. And I'm glad that they did that. There are a lot of bosses that you're gonna compete against in this game, which I just feel like adds a lot of value, which is great too. Now, um, you'll notice, and probably the biggest thing, the biggest change I would say, is a lot of the weaponry. Um, there are no new weapons. Um, if you remember in the first DLC, there was some different weapons that came into play. Although I didn't find them that exciting, particularly they were, you know, something different to do. This game has decided to go back to the standard armament that you would expect Ranger to have going into, you know, the gates of hell. However, a little different this time is that they've added modifier ammo, which basically acts as a separate weapon. So not every single weapon has a modifier, um, but a few do. Um, the nail gun, for example, my absolute favorite weapon in the game is the super nail gun. Well, super nail gun is actually just a lot of fun to shoot, right? And it's a nail gun and you're just, you know, going ham on stuff and having a blast. Um, however, they have changed this now such that the... Um, the super, uh, some of the weapons, like that one, has a unique modifier. Uh, so the nail gun now gets lava nails. So it's a totally separate ammo box that's actually in the game. It looks different. It's like red and glowing. It's very clearly distinctively different than the standard nine inch nails that you pick up from time to time. Um, but the super nail gun has, uh, it, it works on regular, regular nail gun as well as the um, super nail gun. It's just a modifier of the ammo type. Lava nails do more damage to enemies, and it also um, <clears throat> kind of like burns them slowly. So you will shoot a guy in your head and be like, ooh, ooh, ooh. <laughs> a little bit of poison damage, not a ton, a little bit of dots in there, we'll take it. Um, you'll also see the multi-grenade launcher, which I used uh, on the last little part there against that Yeti, and the multi um, grenade basically shoots a single grenade like normal but once it lands um, it explodes into like five or six smaller grenades which is really cool um, there's also an identical functionality for the super uh, i'm sorry for the for the rockets as well and the plasma cell uh, which is a modifier to the thunderbolt and um, these are all a totally separate pool of ammo so it adds more to the weapon wheel and if you're switching around conventionally you may find it a little bit more frustrating because you're going to have to cycle through all those. So if you're cycling from, let's say, the shotgun to the grenade launcher, first button press takes you to the nail gun, second one takes you to lava nails, third one takes you to na uh, super nail gun, fourth one takes you to super nail gun lava nails, and then the fifth button press finally is what's going to get you moving on to launchers. Um, so for that reason alone, I feel like, and I, I don't, I just power through it, but I feel like you're better off um, learning the weapon wheel, which is by holding R1, and it basically stops time almost for a second, which allows you to quickly toggle to the weapon of your choice. If you find yourself needing to switch off, then that's probably the best way to do it because it is a little overwhelming of like switching through multiple weapons and then cycling all the way back around because then you got to go through the same thing again with the grenades, the rockets, and the plasma cell. So it's six more changes to work your way back to, the, uh, to your Fireman X. So keep that in mind um, as you're playing through this as well. Um, they've added in um, a couple different power-ups. Um, one of them is available only in multiplayer, which I haven't had much luck finding a match on. And honestly, I'm not really, I didn't buy this for multiplayer. 
so I don't care too much, but um, there's an anti-gravity belt and a power shield. Um, anti-gravity belt is going to allow you to do some better jumping mechanics, which I'll talk about in a moment. Uh, power shield is going to give you a different type of armor to kind of help you out just a little bit in the battle. Um, I will say, though, overall, in terms of just before I get into the levels, um, I like the arsenal in this game. And I think I actually prefer this approach, even though there's a lot more button swapping. I think I really do prefer this approach to the standard weaponry that we've gotten in the other Quakes. Because I find sometimes, um, and not just to have more ammo, which this game does turn into a just nutso gun fest, like I said. There's just so many different types of weapons that you're just going to pick up. And because of that, there are just so many enemies they've thrown at you. I feel like they knew what they were doing. They basically doubled the weapons in this game, essentially, with all these modifiers. And I feel like they've essentially doubled the enemy account in each of the levels as well to kind of accompany those. So you're going to have a lot of arms and armament. You're going to be plowing through rooms and rooms of, you know, five or six ogres at once, when typically there's only like one or two or you're going to just find like underwater areas that are going to be just absolutely stacked with zombies or with eels and it makes it like kind of overwhelming in a sense um and that's something i'm not really that fond of however i understand the approach behind it so kind of keep that in mind as well um in terms of the level design i think this is really where this dlc is very different than the base game and the first dlc with this DLC, I think you'll find a huge amount of platforming. Um, there are hidden bridges and moving platforms and platforms you have to shoot in a specific amount of time. Certain places to stand on so you don't get crushed. Teleport pads that um, kind of spawn you know, at different intervals that you kind of have to time your jumps across. Invisible walls. Lots of elevators, chain link doors, moving level design. And I think it's all executed incredibly well. It makes the game very different when you have to rely on a lot of these mechanics to kind of work your way through the game. Um, I think particularly where you're going to find a lot of the frustration is in some of those areas where the level is kind of reconfiguring itself. Um, there's a level you'll play a little bit later on. I think it's called like the Caves of Doom or the Caves of Death or something. But the whole level starts basically underground in this giant stone kind of cave area. A lot, a lot of dark shadows. And as you walk from one end of the cave to the other, the whole screen shakes. And you're going to um, find that walls have started to move. And I don't know if this is a thing on the PlayStation or what, but when, you're, when the walls are moving, your character is bouncing so violently it's incredibly difficult to navigate. So you just kind of have to stand there and wait. Unfortunately, there are a lot of places where while that movement is happening, platforms have started to reconfigure and move themselves as well, which is gonna force you to kind of have to move during these moments. And it is a little frustrating. Um, it's very clear to me that they tax this game engine to its limits, I think, on this expansion. They really went all out on level design. Um, although, like I said, it doesn't tell a great story. Um, <clears throat> I have to give them credit. The amount of changing corridors and rooms and design and stuff, I think, is a very, very interesting trait that you typically don't see in these older first-person shooters. Typically, the levels are incredibly static. Um, and while there may be spawning enemies, like right there, uh, or, you know, spawning enemies that are coming in to kind of fight you or whatever, um, I think you're also going to find that um, the levels are very samey. And here, I think a lot of times the path that you need to go on hasn't even really been fully shown to you yet because the walls and the levels and the platforms and the bridges and all this kind of stuff reconfigures itself so much that you may think you understand kind of like where you need to go, but you don't even know that path yet because it hasn't been revealed to you. And I think that is a very fun mechanic and that's something that I really do appreciate behind what they've done with this expansion. Um, later on in other Quake games, because I obviously have the gift of foresight of playing through Quake 2 and 3 and such, um, I can definitely tell that that's quad damage, by the way. 
that's how powerful that quad is, which is that blew me away. Um, I could definitely tell that um, on later levels, they kind of dropped that mechanic. I'm not really sure why. Maybe it was too hard to code against, um, but it does give a very interesting sense kind of of like, what are you doing? And, you know, where are you going? And I, I like that. And you really don't think of first person shooters in that way of like, pseudo exploration of like where am i going to go next but sometimes you'll stand on a pressure plate or something and it'll say hey a wall has been revealed or the way has been revealed or something and it's not entirely clear what that means and i like that i think that's cool so big fan of this expansion for that um final thoughts on kind of overall experience and some final little criticisms of the game um, I do miss, after playing through this, um, I do really miss Trent Reznor slash Nine Inch Nails on this expansion. Um, I really feel like this game definitely gets in much more of a very samey, I don't want to say a slog, but it almost feels that way sometimes because it is so much of the same stuff. Yes. The level design, I think, carries it significantly, and I think some of the new weapons are great as well. It was exciting to fight bosses, but in between all those other moments, it was very similar to the base game. I, I don't feel like they took enough chances with the level design, and as a result of that, you are going to spend a lot of time looping around levels, trying to figure out where you're supposed to go next, and what secret door actually opened and where's the next area because it's not always very clear and i miss having there's one of the invisible walls i miss having um a nine inch nail soundtrack because i feel like it would have carried this game differently this soundtrack doesn't really fit with the game it just doesn't feel like it feels like an afterthought i know it was the same sound designer who worked on the last one there i thought it worked very well because i thought it told much more of an original story here not so much so i would say that's probably my single biggest criticism is just the sheer amount of just kind of boring sound that you're going to hear in the background my other criticism is as much as i love the new weapon types and i understand that the enemy count would need to increase in order to kind of make the game feel a little more full um, I feel like there is way too, watch this, when it, this is, I'm going to throw my control on the ground the moment right here. I'm like, I'm timing the laser, got it, okay, 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 I'm going to go through it, Brant, dead. And that's why we safety save, folks. Um, yeah, I, I feel like the sheer, and the reason why, by the way, that I'm just sitting here is at this point, I stood up and I like raged. I like stormed across the game room like madly. <laughs> All right, so back to the quad damage and we'll wrap up this level and be done. Um, what I was gonna say though is that um, it, I like the enemy count. I just wish they were more obvious where they were at. Um, far too often I had enemies spawn directly behind me and really chew up my armor and health for no good reason. I don't mind getting hit. I don't mind that. And I don't mind, you know, kind of understanding the rules of like, you're going to get armor, you're going to get health, you're going to go in a big boss fight, you're going to lose armor and health, but you're going to need to kind of like work your way through these big areas. And I understand that, but I felt very cheated at times that like, I worked really hard to find a secret area, to find red armor, to find some great weapon or super health or something. I think they call it mega health, but whatever. Like I, I worked really hard to find something like that. And then only to turn around and lose it instantly because I had an ogre or three teleport directly behind me. And there was absolutely nothing I could have done to prevent getting hit. Um, I never once thought Quake would be a game where you could play in its entirety without ever getting hit. That never dawned on me or I never really felt that way. I, I understood the loop of building up and losing and that's been very prevalent through the entire series and this DLC in particular. I just felt like at times I lost too much health in a you know, safety save, right? There you go. Um, I just felt that I lost health a little bit too quickly at places that wasn't really my fault. So take it all with a grain of salt. Remember, all of this was on the, uh, I picked it up on the PlayStation Store for $10, guys. I probably got 30 plus hours of enjoyment out of all this DLC so far, and I still have more to cover. I got two more DLC packs to cover. So we got a long way to go, but if you are a fan, do yourself a favor, check this game out. Thank you guys so much for watching. Hope you enjoyed the video. Sorry for the upload quality. Not really sure what happened there. It was a little, a little fuzzy, but you, know, you figured it out. Until next time, I will see you guys on the other side.